Good evening everyone, time for another episode of Kerr's Rage, part one of the Dwarad Heemstaff Saga, by me. Today will be episode 18, starting on page 192. Alright, we'll start a little bit from the previous page to get going on that paragraph. Okay. Their journey north, the chapter is New Fountain. Their journey north proved uneventful. Dense clouds had moved in during the night, and a steady drizzle was turning the road to mud. But centuries of use had hardened it, and they made good time despite the weather. They would reach New Fountain on schedule. <clears throat> the city was buzzing with activity. Its southern gate was open and long trains of wagons were leaving. Each cart was heavily laden with personal goods, furniture, entire families, and more. At the head of the wagon train were two merchant caravans with fully twice the usual number of guards. Something drastic was happening, and the city's inhabitants were leaving in a hurry. To complicate things, the weather was getting worse. The drizzle had turned to rain with a biting wind. Riding ahead... Tarek hailed the caravan leader. Ho oh, there, Tarek yelled. What news from Nordtown? They are besieged, the guard answered. Red orcs, they say. Best turn around, traveler, and head back to where you came from. North isn't the safest direction to be headed in now. How many days ago? Yesterday? Today? No one's certain. But scouts have returned with news of fires in a great horde. Beware the pass if that's where you're headed, stranger. And then the caravan scout had to ride on, leaving Tarek and his company behind him. The faces of those riding with him were sorrowful and scared, but though he tried, he could gain little more news. It seemed that no one knew for sure if the village had been attacked or if it was still under siege. No one seemed to be prepared to wait and find out. Nothing is certain, Carmen, except that something big is happening. We served with Baron Dutchings at Highcrest Garrison. He's a great tactician. If anyone c could defend Nordtown against a Red Orkin onslaught, with only two companies of soldiers, it's him. With luck, he called for reinforcements in time. Inside Newfontain, all the private shops had been boarded up, or in the process of being closed. Everyone was strapping bundles to pack horses or loading wagons in preparation for an extended leave. Carmen rode up beside one such shop owner. Good sir, what's all the commotion about? The old man turned and smiled, a gap-toothed grin. We're all headed to Newfound Castle before the orcs get here. They're coming, same as they did nearly a hundred years ago. Sure as my name's Thomas Southern, and if I was you, I'd be headed there too. There's supposed to be a horde unlike nothing ever heard of before. Now if and you'll excuse me, miss, I've got to get to packing. Leading them through the streets, she and Tara questioned several city guardsmen who were aiding the townspeople in their preparations. They all wore the golden lion symbol of Lord Cherrick, and if anyone knew what was going on, it would be them. Seeking a man of rank, she found one. He was a large, grey-bearded man, arrayed in a male shirt of heavy rings, wearing the rank of Master of Sergeants upon his tunic. It was the highest rank attainable by common soldiers, and such men deserved the highest respect, although they too seldom received it. She dismissed and led Alger by his halter. She hailed the master of sergeants with, with the clenched fist signal of fellow soldiers, right fist closed over her left breast. She was relieved when he returned her greeting. And who is this gallant, he said, who would greet an old soldier with the clenched fist? Carmen Anastasia, Master Sergeant, daughter of Sir William of Waysboro, and Sergeant of the 3rd Mountain Brigade. We are on a mission of some importance to the King. For the King, he answered laughing. He chooses strange warriors for important missions these days. Master of Sergeants, our scouting mission is vital. Any information that you may have that could assist us? Vital, you say? I have a thousand or so people to get to safety and not much time to get it done. Ask what you must and be gone. How fares Nordtown? And is the pass still open? He reported, 
The 5th Regiment is at Nordtown with Red Dragon Company, and they are under siege by a terrible host of orcs. It's been almost two days since the battle started. Messengers have been sent to the king for reinforcements, as well as to Lord Min of the dwarves. I fear that they will arrive too late to help. Just pray. <clears throat> Just pray that the fifth can hold them off long enough for the innocents to escape. Stopping for a moment, he issued commands to his waiting soldiers and delivered a salute to his commanding officer. As for the past sergeant, none can be sure although it's sure to be the escape route the Baron will choose should their strength fail. He was finished then, and turning with hardly a nod, he left, and though Carmen tried to question him further, he heard her voice no more. Sometimes it was hard to be a woman. Continuing through the city, they could find no one with first-hand information. Everywhere, people were in a panic, and if they feared a coming storm and were craving not as if they feared a coming storm, and were craving not but a safe place to wait it out. Kalor and Leander purchased enough fresh rations to last them a week. The street vendor was trying to sell the last of his goods before he was forced to leave. Paying less than half the usual price, it was a wonderful bounty. They left through the north gates. Soldiers had built many hasty fortifications across the town streets in preparation for the city's defense. Many shouted to them of their foolishness, Riding north will only bring your deaths. No one can withstand the horde with such small numbers. Ride on, fools. And if any among their company felt that those words were true, none mentioned it, for they were young and strong and equal of any danger. Filled with the confidence of youth, they trusted in friendship. They felt that together they could achieve the impossible. The biting wind and rain continued beneath darkening skies, but their strong cloaks and gypsy blankets protected them. Their own inner fires burned hot with purpose. Highland Pass Pushing their mounts hard for the remainder of the day, they rode through the farmlands to the south of the Ogrefangs. Every farm was deserted save one. An old man sat on the front porch of his homestead with a long briarwood pipe between his gnarled fingers. Clearly he would not be moved by mortal man nor orc and horde. He sat there, patiently watching the sunset, tapping his fingers upon the arm of his old rocker. Only a casual wink and the gleam in his right eye told him that he was aware of them at all. We'll reach the foothills by nightfall, Tarek said, and make camp at the base of the pass. The rain had finally stopped, but the sky remained dark and ominous. The stony road was slick from the rain and the wind howled down from the mountains. The road wound higher. I'm worried, Carmen. It looks as if no one has passed through recently, although the rain could have washed away the sign. Perhaps the Baron chose some other means for the refugees to escape. There is no other. Reaching the base of the pass, Tarek led them on, looking for a suitable campsite. It took nearly an hour, but he discovered a deep cleft at the base of a cliff, and they encamped there. The cliffs above them were sheer, indomitable, and any break from the constant wind that they could find was a welcome reprieve. If they were going to remain at their best, they would need to stay as healthy as possible to survive in a cold and wet environment. They would need every opportunity to dry off and warm up. The fact that Tarek was able to find wood in a land of mountains and stone was a testimony to his skill. He shaved chips from the branches of spruce and thornwood, finally coaxing flame into the wet tinder with flint and steel. Soon Kayla was cooking a suitable meal, and his hearty stew drove away the nighttime chill. <clears throat> Leander meditated, searching for woodland spirits to guide them. He even asked questions of the spirit of fire, but whether the spirits were absent or they heard him not could not be known, for he received no answers. They took turns with the night's watch, their vigilance keen with the threat of war. Wakening with a start, Kalor peered fearfully into the night. Can't you see them, Dartin? The eyes? See what, Kalor? Terrible glowing eyes watching me in the shadows. They're there one moment and then gone the next. Surely you can see them now, staring. Kalor, your necklace glows pale and golden. Can you not see that? It is warm, 
but I swear to you that something watches us. But then the camp was awake and mobile. By then, the camp was awake and mobile. Tarek, why don't you take her for a look around? Kalor swears that there's something out there. They searched for a great distance, but they could find no sign of an intruder. They encountered nothing but the chanting wind. There's nothing out there, Kalor, Tarek said. No tracks, no sign. Don't worry, boy, Kerr said. These high cliffs have a way of playing tricks on the mind, especially at night. Their search lightened Kalor's heart, but sleep never returned to him that night. Lying there beneath the towering mountain peaks made them all feel small and inconsequential. They all were of like mind in their desire to escape its cold, unyielding walls. Carmen spoke quietly to Tarek of it. I feel that Kalor's necklace bears some terrible curse. It seems to be driving him mad. <clears throat> Time will tell, I fear. Let us hope that the gnome can figure out how to remove it before anything bad happens. For now, we need to concentrate on the pass. The morning sky dawned bright and clear, but the sun did little to warm them amid the constant wind. Breaking camp, they rode into the pass. The rocky road wound higher and higher, and the cliff walls twisted with it so that little of the road ahead could be seen. By noon, the trail had finally begun to descend and widen. It was the only sign that they were nearing the end of the mountain passage. Kalor felt the eerie sensation of yearning eyes throughout their journey. Sometimes they seemed to watch him from above, sometimes from behind him, and although his comrades tried to aid him in his search, none save he could feel their insidious gaze. The Ender stayed close to him and told him stories to try and lighten his mood, but even he feared that Kalor was losing his mind. Kerr uncorked a vintage year, vintage year of his mushroom wine, passing it around so their spirits rose. They had never known Kalor to be afraid of shadows before. But Kalor himself was beginning to realize that all his current troubles came from the magic held within the necklace. Its weight was becoming a terrible burden, and his shoulders slumped beneath the invisible load. They reached the end of the pass at the day's end. Before them lay a long span of foothills, and beyond that the valley of Nordtown. Below them, a long caravan of refugees were moving toward them with all the speed they could muster. Each wagon was loaded to capacity with the wounded and the elderly, many of whom had already departed from the world of the living. Wagons, horses, and more exotic beasts of burden were all bearing heavy loads, and the faces of the victims were filled with pain and sorrow. Carmen rode ahead to greet them, Riding along their tracks, she couldn't stem the flow of tears that came unbidden to her eyes. Just so, neither any were any of her companions unaffected. A lanky, blood-stained warrior rode to meet them. His uniform hung about his armor in tatters, and Carmen could make out the rank of corporal upon his shoulders. You carry yourselves as soldiers, and I beseech your help. My second is grievously wounded, and I fear that he will not last the night. By all the gods, do you have a physician among you? Dart in! Bring me to him, so that the eye of Odin may gaze upon him. Our priest was slain in battle, the soldier said. The orcs took pleasure in mutilating his body, dragging him through the streets and feeding him to their war dogs. In the end, we were fighting building to building. We claimed the lives of many orcs, but, like a, num but a like number of our own were slain, and many were taken prisoner. That's uh, my take on the uh, the ranger, the soldier that was dragged through the streets of Somalia during, uh, after the Battle of Mogadishu. Uh, so, pretty poignant moment in history. Leading them to the last wagon, they found his second lying near unto death. He is Darren heavy-handed, and he fought without thought for his own life so that we could escape. He was the only member of the rear guard that I could carry away in time. Dartin quickly prepared a salve of healing herbs, medis medical instruments and bandages from his saddlebag. Examining Darren, he couldn't understand why the man was still alive. Four arrows had struck him in the chest, and the marks of many more wounds could be seen bleeding through the remains of his armor. It would take all of Dartin's skill and the greatest luck just to avoid killing him in the process of removing his armor and clothing. The arrow shafts had to be removed or the healing rune would try to knit the flesh around them. 
Luckily for Darren, he was unconscious. How many others are hurt as badly as he? He's the worst of them. Many others are wounded, but they'll live. The others are already dead. The company dismounted and joined them, hoping to be of help. What tribe led the attack, Kerr asked, or was there only one? I'm no expert, the corporal replied, but I remember their standard. It was a red moon upon a black field. Was there another? Yes, one that I didn't understand. It was a golden circle, and within it a taloned hand clutching a lightning bolt. Those were the only two. I am sure of it. The followers of the moon, Kerr said grimly, and the drums of doom. My father once told me of their ways. He cringed as Datin pulled the second arrow out of Darren. If he left any foreign matter inside of the man's body, he would be forever crippled or worse. Kerr conversed with the corporal, while the others rendered what help that they could to the wounded. The corporal was one of the only five surviving members of Lord Cherrick's 5th Regiment. Tarek rode ahead of them and stood a silent watch, lest a pursuing band of orcs should happen upon them in surprise. When the last of the broken arrows were removed, Darchin cleaned the wounds as quickly as he could. Darren's body was giving up its fight against the merciless one, and he had no time left to wait. And so he focused his mind, summoning forth Odin's rune, and where he drew it upon the man's tortured flesh, his body began to heal, and where he laid his hands, torn tissue reformed, broken bones fused, and ligaments and tendons joined. The task was tormenting, bringing with it a terrible price, for when each of Darren's wounds left him, they became Dartin's own for a time, and it was by will alone that he remained conscious. It was a credit to his strength that he didn't die from the attempt. He bled. Sweat poured from him. Odin's power flowed through him. All that he knew was pain, but that was the peril of casting Odin's runes, and in the end the strain was too great and darkness claimed him. For a moment he hovered outside of his own body. Looking down, it lay crumpled in a heap at his patient's feet. His breathing was urgent, as if he'd just run a great distance. But he was alive, and both bodies were healed. He had prayed to Odin, and his prayers had been answered. Darren lived. Pink scars stood out upon his skin where torn flesh had been only moments before. His breathing was constant and his pulse was strong. It was clear that he would live on. Kerr and Corporal Ranyar looked upon them with amazement, for here was a true healer, and although many possessed lesser gifts that were similar to his, Dartin possessed power unheard of. When they were certain there was only exhaustion that had caused his collapse, Ranyar told Kerr of the previous day's battle. We were taking leave from our border guard when the orcs descended upon the town from the north. They must have crept up on us silently during the night and lain in wait until dawn, for none of us saw or heard their coming. The entire regiment mustered to the call, and we held them for as long as we could. <clears throat> but it was no use. They poured down on us with numbers that seemed without end, and once our main lines were broken, we never regained the strength to regroup. Many of our archers were trapped upon rooftops and surrounded. The orcs burned them down one by one and killed them all. Several times we rallied, and at times it seemed as if we'd break through, but for each orc that fell, two more took their places. In the end, all that we could do was retreat with whomever was still capable of running. Many sacrificed themselves so that we could escape. Most of the women and children were captured. When the fight started... We put them all in the stone church with a squad of our best fighters. God knows what has become of them. What evils the orcs had planned, I cannot say. I will never forgive myself for letting them be taken. And now they are beyond our help. There was nothing else that you could have done, Kerr said. These people owe you their lives. Be wary of them, warrior. The orcs command fierce war dogs, the likes of which I have never seen. <clears throat> and among them walk giants. Newfound Castle's your best bet. It's the closest place that you'll find help and shelter for your people. I'll ride on until Khan if I have to. And without further ado, the two corporals said farewell, for the threat of danger was too great for further comradeship. Soon after, 
Vrenya's caravan limped away into the black maw of Highland Pass, and it was a long time before Kerr saw him again. With the caravan away, Tarek searched for a defensible campsite because Dartin was too worn out for travel. He soon found, he soon found one that suited their needs. Carmen, there is a high oak cropping in the rock not far from here. From that promontory, we can view the entire valley below. Is it defensible? It can only be reached by a pathway on the south side or by a dangerous climb. Good. We'll make camp there. And that's where we'll end today's episode on the top of page 201. And that's where we we'll begin episode 19. Thank you, and as always... Remember to read Kerr's Wage, part one of the Dwarred Staff Saga, and all of its other following books by me. Thank you, and I hope you enjoyed it. Have a great night.